even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life. Whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I am excited today to talk about getting real and how to be real in relationships, all the way from romantic to family to friendships to work. And you know what I find from having coached people for the last 15 years is that so often we are afraid to get real. And one of the most common questions I get is, well, how do I say that? You know, they come in with an issue with someone and it's like, how do I say that? And I'm like, well, exactly like you just said it. But there's this fear that if we say something that's too real, you know, that people are going to leave us or get upset with us. But our guest today is an expert in how to get real and how to say things in a way to get closer to people. So we have Dr. Susan Campbell here. Susan, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Shana. And for those of you who haven't read Susan's amazing, what is it? Is it 10 books now that you've written? Yes. On relationships and conflict resolution, she's delivered, you know, she's written these books. She's delivered hundreds of seminars and workshops internationally has counseled thousands of individuals and couples. She's been on CNN's Night News and Good Morning America. Um, And she's also been accomplished in the business world and directed think tanks and run nonprofit organizations and consulted Fortune 500 companies. She's guest lectured at Harvard, Stanford, and UCLA business schools. So she has, uh, you know, an incredible depth of knowledge Um, as well as, you know, you're an adventurer. You've been living on a sailboat and lived in other cultures and, you know, you've made millions and lost millions. So I feel really excited to have this conversation today. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me of all of that stuff that I've done (laughs) in in this one life. Yes. One life. Well, okay, let's start out then. If that, that, if, if that's reminding you Let's see um, first, you know, and I love this because we already have like, we, we have to be real here, right? Because this is our topic. So, you know, what would you say, what's most inspiring to you these days in the realm of getting real or what's even come beyond that? You know, what still inspires me most is other people's pain. Hmm. I guess in my younger days, what inspired me most was my own pain. Uh that's why I wrote the book, The Couple's Journey, back in the late 70s, came out in 1980. It was because I had gone through several divorces already Mm. and wanted to learn what what couples knew that I didn't. But now, I, you know, I'm not in pain about anything other than the general state of humanity. Yeah, that's Um, that's real. Yeah, that's real. And that hurts (laughs) my heart. And I, I also... Uh, know from where I've worked to get to is that you can both feel the joy of being in the present moment and having just just a blessed life like I do Mm -hmm. and at the same time hold that paradox of the pain of the world Mm. um, that that inspires me just 
personally, but work-wise, I think the thing that inspires me is other people's pain. Mm. Because every day I hear clients, I did a teleclass yesterday, and I hear clients say, you know, they don't value me where I work. Uh And when I listen deeper into the complaint, they don't value me. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of stuff in somebody's imagination. Uh, you know, he's expecting to be treated a certain way, but he's never told them how he likes to be treated. Mm. Same thing in relationships, you know, expect it, it, This is, you know, it just breaks my heart. I'm going to, because I'm old, I can say this. <laughs> some of the naive assumptions that some younger people make about what you can expect in a relationship. Yeah. Basically, it's a, boils down to expecting the other person should know what I need if I tell them once or if I hint around or right. if they really love me. Well, right. And then we've been raised in this culture to, I mean, in different ways, men and women both have been raised to not really ask for what they want. And, you know, women, a lot of women I meet and have coached, they feel like they're too needy or they're too high maintenance and then the men come to me and they don't want to ask because they think they should already know. Yes. So, you know, I'm curious about that too. Like as you've worked with these thousands of people um, and especially men, because this podcast is geared toward men, you know, what do you see gets in the way the most of, of men getting real? Well, when you mentioned they think that they should already know, and this is a, a common syndrome among males the way uh, our males are conditioned Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm thinking of the the current me too movement Mm -hmm. and the men saying well what's okay now and that's really coming up I've done I've done some webinars on this for men and women to share and it's like we're looking for some rules so we don't get into trouble with women and here's the here's the advice could you just Stop looking for rules and look at the woman in front of you and let her know that you are concerned about this, that you are feeling this fear of doing the wrong thing and that you can ask her, what, what's okay? Is it, is it still okay? Is it still okay if, you know, if I just come up and grab you from behind or whatever, you know, whatever you're wondering, Yeah. or is it still okay to call you, say, hi, cutie? in the workplace, you just have to ask the individual women because there is no one way that women are. Well, right, that is true. (laughs) (laughs) But it takes guts to look look stupid. Well, that's what I was gonna say, it takes guts. Any man who asks me that, whether it's in the boardroom or the bedroom, you know, what do you like? I just feel so much more love and respect for that man. Yes. Yes, I do too. And uh, I imagine that men listening might find themselves kind of in a pickle too, where it's like, wait, now I'm supposed to go ask every woman who I work with how she wants to be treated and how to, you know, relate to her in a way that she feels respected. And so I'm curious what you would say to that. I would say, well, don't make a rule out of that. that you're going- <laughs> <laughs> ask every woman it's when it's in your heart and mind uh-huh. in a moment in a given moment see what getting real is about that's the title of, of the book that you you know that you guys know the most about yeah. I've yeah. written. um the whole idea is what's real is what's going on for you in this very moment right. not no. looking for some generic prescription of how to be a good man yes so if you're if if you're wondering something, then you ask. But if you're not wondering, don't ask. I love that you just made that distinction, right? Because I think it really is easy to turn even non-rules into rules. And so in this, it's like, all right, show up in the present moment. And if it's there for you, or if there's some confusion or there's some frustration, then actually ask and talk about it. Yeah, and one of the one of the um, best devices that I know for bringing a conversation between yourself and another person. Let's say I'm talking to a man, so mm-hmm. between yourself and a woman that maybe you're interested in, let's say, into the present moment, is the little device that's the first chapter of my book, saying what's real. Mm-hmm. And that device is 
either say out loud or say to yourself this phrase, hearing you say that, I feel. Mm. That's, you know, and then dot, dot, dot. Uh, hearing you say that, I feel afraid. Somebody says to you, uh, you're late for our dinner. Uh-huh. You know, I was expecting you half an hour ago. Well, you could get defensive and start explaining yourself. Mm-hmm. Or if you were to check in with yourself and notice that you're starting to feel defensive, then you're all of a sudden more present. Yes. And, it, and then you're a little more choiceful. Maybe you still will will offer an explanation but at least you'll do it with awareness rather than this automatic defensive what i call control pattern because oh. people just automatically go into explaining as you know, as a as a way to stay safe and in control well that's a really great point too right that it feels safer to defend or to be in control than it does to actually be vulnerable and you know, in in your book, you said 80% of the average person's communications are geared toward controlling things that are actually beyond the person's control. And so, right, it sounds like most of the time, most of us are walking around in these conversations that are not real or they're not present in the moment. They're more defended or explanations or we're on automatic. It's, mm-hmm. it's that's kind of the key. The key is to look at when you're on automatic. Yeah. Um, and automatic usually means you're protecting or defending uh, your your ego, your self image. You want people to see you a certain way. So when I say that eighty percent of communication comes from the intent to control. Yeah. I don't mean the obvious forms of control like being bossy or manipulative what uh what i explain in the book getting real and then much better in my latest book five minute relationship repair Mm -hmm. i explain that human beings have all these automatic patterns one of them is explaining and defending but one of them might be instead of asking for what you want asking indirectly like wouldn't you like to go out for (laughs) some tonight you know instead of saying hey i'd like to go out for sushi what about Are, are you cold when we're yeah, are you cold? That's, that's all that. Or, or um, just staying silent can uh-huh. be a control pattern uh, to avoid getting yourself into trouble by speaking the truth. Yeah. Or just agreeing too quickly to something that somebody asks you before checking in. Is this really true for me? Like agreeing wow. to help with something and later regretting it. It's really, it's painful. Millions of control patterns. Yeah, no, it's painful as you talk. I'm like, okay, I do every single one of those and it's much better than it was 20 years ago, but I still catch myself doing them. And, you know, I remember a situation a couple years ago where I recognized that I was, um, I could see the tiredness in, I was dating a man, I could see the tiredness in his eyes. And so I just kind of, dulled myself down to what I imagined he might be available for as we were together. And later, as we talked about it, he's like, sure, I was tired. But if you had asked me, you know, to go take a walk or go do something else, like I I, I probably would have been up for that. But instead, I found myself, you know, like you said, just not even asking, not even, um, not even necessarily knowing what I wanted and needed in that moment. Well, that's a beautiful example. Shana, because um, there's an exercise in the Getting Real book on the chapter on revising, Mm -hmm. revising something later on. Like, so later on, you realized that you had kind of gone on automatic and just assumed that this guy wasn't up for much. And then you sort of depress your own energy. Uh And But if you do realize that later, a lot of times, or realize anything later that you were in an in a pattern or you said yes when you wished you'd said no you can go out and come in again yeah and go back in most cases some some it's not appropriate but you can go back and say you know when we were together last night i noticed i was doing this da 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 and if i had it to do over Mm -hmm. here's what i would have done or even better here's what i would have said and say the exact words the second time around that you would have said, and that trains you to be more present in the future. I think that is so useful for couples. And, you know, often when I'm coaching too, I talk about the debrief. It's like, yeah, you have an experience together, debriefing it after to say what went well, what you would have liked differently. 
And even that's challenging for people to imagine. But then what you're saying, right, I could see it can be even more challenging to imagine, like, wow, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say to someone, you know, this is what I didn't say, or this is what I would have said if I really was being honest. And I think it's so powerful, especially in a long-term relationship, but even, you know, in a shorter relationship or at work, I mean, all of these places it can it can really benefit. Yeah, and even if it's not appropriate to go back, like maybe some person you're not in a couple with or it's at work and you don't have that kind of contract with the person, you can do it at the end of the day for yourself. Yes. Just do, I call it the daily authenticity inventory. Mm. When didn't I show up for myself fully today? Oh. I find myself on automatic. If I had it to do over, what would I say? And there's another question in there, which is what, what's, what excuses or reasons do I give myself for not? Uh -huh. that, that, that leads to some self-insight. So you can add yeah. that one in there. Okay, so daily authenticity. Uh, daily authenticity inventory. It's, it's one of the most useful tools that I offer my coaching clients. So it's I love that. And I love it even if you aren't saying it to someone else. I mean, really, the most important relationship you have is with yourself, right? And so if you can actually be recognizing and, um, you know, starting to reveal things to yourself. I remember a question I used to use years ago that I forgot about was like, what, what truth am I not letting myself know, <laughs> you know, which is a weird question, but it kind of gets to the heart of that. And, and as you let yourself realize, oh, I could have said that, or I, I wanted to say that, or I didn't ask for this, then I would imagine you become stronger to be able to say that in the next conversation. Yeah. Even if you just say it to yourself, but I counsel to Say the exact words mm -hmm. so that you can feel, gee, it's even risky saying it by myself in my own bedroom. Right. <laughs> so it can be kind of risky, especially if it's, you know, a truth that has never been spoken before. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, in the five minute relationship repair, your new book, it sounds like you really help couples with this to be able to see how they're not getting real or what's getting in the way of uh, when there's conflict? Yes. Whenever there's any kind of conflict that leads to uh, somebody either blowing up, shutting down, or going into some kind of just control pattern where uh -huh. they're um, just on automatic, I counsel the couples to come back later. I'll, I'll give you more detail on this if, if we decide to go there, but yeah. come back later and do a revision and even even when you're terribly triggered and you're both both triggered and, and one person shuts down the other person blows up and maybe there's some name calling or some at least some labeling you mm -hmm. know or you're all you know you're you're always too tired you know that uh -huh. kind of thing. those who, whenever anybody says always or never that that's a signal that they're coming from a triggered place and uh -huh. triggered, Triggered basically means you've totally gone on, on automatic and the part of the brain that goes into fight, flight, or freeze has gotten in charge. Mm -hmm. And once that part of the brain gets in charge, couples or even dating partners mm -hmm. or even at work, you need to pause. Couples need a pause agreement at work, it's harder to get that, but uh, so some sophisticated workplaces now have invited me in to talk about triggers, and they mm. know that they know that people bring their triggers to work just like in like, their life. Yes, like we have them at home. Yeah, and triggers are things like the fear of rejection, abandonment, being criticized, being controlled, being unimportant. And I imagine most of our listeners at least can pick one of those <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. In my workshops, I do these fa this favorite fears, or not in workshops, usually in lectures. I do a favorite fears contest, and I'll just ask for a show of hands. How many people have a fear of abandonment? How many people have a fear of being controlled? And mm. geez, just about everybody raises their hand at all of them. Yeah, I was going to say, right, if someone can't think of one, then I'm in the doghouse because they all apply. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're all there at some point. 
Yeah. So um, the five minute relationship repair book is actually a self help workbook for partnerships where you first learn to identify what your triggers are, which means uh -huh. what's the core fear? Like, is your core fear more about being abandoned or is it be more like being smothered, controlled, or overwhelmed? Uh -huh. yeah. And sometimes those two attachment styles get together because they have so much to learn from each other once they learn how to work with their triggers. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have a, a, a really a four part formula in this book, pause, then calm your nervous system. Because, mm -hmm. First of all, pause because if you keep talking while your reptilian brain is in charge, you're just going to do more yeah, than be deep shit. Uh, yeah, it's deep. <laughs> Don't dig the hole deeper. So yeah. Stop digging. So pause, then calm your nervous system. And I wish we would teach in schools. Uh -huh. Some schools do teach self Yeah, they're starting to. You know, breathing practices, yeah. body awareness practices. Some of us have our own practices, but the book offers uh, several good ones. Mm -hmm. And then inquire look at feel feel the feeling that got triggered and it just starts out with some agitated body sensation or maybe you don't have feelings right away maybe you have thoughts like um, she can't treat me that way you know and you start with wherever you are and find the feeling and just follow it and follow it and stay with it mm, like so for that when the she can't treat me that way that's the thought and then you guide the people thought, but there's a feeling feel the feeling yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. always whenever there's a charged thought like that mm -hmm. uh it's always good to ask yourself or for coaches to ask their clients as you say those words what, what are you feeling, feeling? Mm -hmm. you notice in your body is this is sort of the the basic getting real intervention. Yes. So I train getting real coaches and it's really not that hard if you know if you have confidence in this practice because yeah. you've done it enough with yourself. You just stay with it. Mm -hmm. And your attention will go where it needs to go to find maybe that place of hurt or that unfinished business from the past or maybe it's not even too far in the past, but you'll find that bundle of emotional pain mm -hmm. that you've been trying to hide from or run away from with all your defensive patterns yeah. and you can open up your you know, triggers force you kind of to, to see these things so yeah. that's the good news it's good to have somebody who triggers you and then right. you i like that perspective right that actually it's good to have them because then yeah you're... otherwise how would you know you know if you're just alone you know in an ashram how would you know although i've actually found quite good benefits for meditation too. Yes, um, for sure. But back to relationships, which are the, the crash course, the fast yep. course, I think. And um, if you just follow your sensations and your feelings and some painful memory comes up, you can hold that younger version of yourself or just that hurting part of yourself mm -hmm. with compassion, yeah. letting it have its pain, not saying, Oh, you know, you're great just because that guy mistreated you. Others will like you. None of this phony reassurance. Just the pain is real in that moment. Yeah. Or as a child, it was real and it probably didn't get to complete itself. Yeah. Uh, human beings are just full of unprocessed emotional pain from the past. And so the ability to stay with a feeling and let it complete itself at least a little bit. Oh, it's sort of like you're doing therapy on yourself. So that's all right after you get triggered. You pause, you calm, you inquire, do a, a I call it a compassionate self inquiry. Uh -huh. Then you're ready to go back and fill out your repair script. I've offered several repair scripts. In oh, I love it. In the book. And also, you can get the workbook free on the on the uh, website, five minute relationship repair.com. And so you have these scripts where people can you just fill order. Out. Yeah, even if you don't order the book, you can get the scripts anyway. And this right. they, you know, I'm sorry that, that I uh, called you a cold fish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was, tr I was triggered. It was probably my fear of not of that. My needs don't matter. Uh huh. Uh, acting up here. And so you've done enough self-inquiry to take responsibility for 
the fact that you were in pain and you were lashing out from yeah. an automatic reptilian place. And now you got your higher brain back online. And that's the part of the brain that can love and care about the other person. So you got your empathy back. And, and so you, you reveal. Then the, the repair is, is basically a, a giant reveal and then an, of what was really going on. And then an asking for some simple reassurance like, if I had it to go over, I would have told you I needed to feel important and I would have asked for reassurance. Mm. Relationship is important to you. And, and, and leave it at that. I it's a very that. short repair script. And that's why I call it the five minute relationship repair. You shouldn't have to do three hours of processing after a fight. No. If you're doing that, that means you're just explaining and defending and getting back into it. Yeah. And right, unless it's taken you somewhere else. Do, and... do, uh, you know, do the makeup after a fight all wrong. Sex mm -hmm. is good. Sex is good. But you do need to talk sometimes. Well, right. I mean, if you don't actually talk or you don't actually get to what you're saying, that vulnerable piece underneath, then it just keeps repeating itself and repeating yeah. itself. Exactly. Yeah. You really do need to talk. Yeah. Yeah, I feel inspired by that. And, and I, <laughs> I remember... One time when I was married years ago, I think we had a, we, at some point we instituted a, like, we can only fight for 10 minutes or something like that. And we looked at the clock one time and we we're like, okay, that's 10 minutes. And then we did, we took some time to calm down and, you know, go our separate ways and realize like, oh, we, we used to spend hours doing that. What a brilliant thing that you guys <laughs> discovered on your own. Well, I'm impressed. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it probably came from some book or workshop or whatever we were exploring at the time. But, you know, I love what you're saying, too, as far as um, it doesn't have to take that long to repair. And actually, what it seems to me is that you're, you're getting to the heart of the matter, right? Instead yeah. of defending, explaining, you know, all of this stuff, talking around it. You're actually going right to the most vulnerable place, which could be a challenge for a lot of people, and saying, this is what I was really feeling, and this is, this is the inadequacy or the fear or you know, the, the part of me that doesn't have it all together. The vulnerability. You're really revealing a vulnerability, and then your partner feels safe, and they want to reassure you. Yeah. You're not attacking them anymore. Well, and especially, I mean, this is interesting because, you know, gearing this toward men, a lot of men have come to me and said, my wife is still attacking me, so I will get vulnerable hmm. and she's still, you know, on a rampage. And I'm curious how you work with couples when that happens. Well, I would try to um, get them both on the same page with the practice. Mm -hmm. It's very important that couples together... together have yeah. agreed upon practices for dealing with their differences and upset. Yeah. Yep. So if, if you, if you're doing it and your wife doesn't, your partner doesn't, um, tell her how much you love her and how much you value this relationship and how important it is that you guys develop some ongoing practices because otherwise you're afraid it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think there is the reality that sometimes people have to get honest and realize, you know, if someone's going to keep harassing me or abusing me or making demands or not listening to me. And if I keep getting vulnerable and, and, you know, someone's not meeting me there, then the relationship may not be the right one or it's time to get some counseling and some help. Well, uh, tell the, tell the person first, you know, I mean, if they won't get the, get the counseling and you've, yeah. you've tried that tech, you know, and, and you're thinking of ending it, the, give them a little warning first and say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I can still stay in this relationship yeah. if we don't do something like this. And maybe it sounds like a threat, but it's, you know, I, I, have, a right, I have a right to want a good life. I want a good life. My preference is a good life with you. Yeah. But if I can't have it with you, I don't want it like this. Yeah. So you really have to stand your ground and ask strongly sometimes for what you want. Yeah, and I appreciate people give up a little too soon. They say, "Oh, I've tried this. I've tried this." But have you tried really putting it to her? You know, uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, right. This is like an ultimatum. Yeah, 
And you it, don't right, use ultimatums you, frivolously, but you use them when they're real. Right. And really, I love the piece that you're talking about too of that strength. And, you know, like you said before, the triggers actually call out or help us see and grow in these parts of ourselves. And, you know, that to be called out to actually stand up for yourself and put a stake in the ground and say, I'm, I'm worth this and I need this. And, you know, this is, this is the kind of relationship I want and need to have. And I want you to do it with me. I mean, that does, it takes an incredible amount of whatever you want to call it, you know, chutzpah or strength or, or balls or, you know, but without that, I think we can end up in these, these patterns of relationship that aren't fulfilling and that are, you know, not respecting each other. Yeah. And there will be some partners um, who are so defended that it's just too, too scary yeah. uh, to do this work. But if you can get them to a skilled counselor, usually the counselor can help them feel safe enough. Because mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've had a lot of men drag women into my office. Mm, interesting. The other way around, but not necessarily, not in my practice. Yeah. I'm, I'm like you, Shane. I'm very man friendly. Uh -huh. I've always <laughs> had tremendous empathy for men. I've had a great relationship with my dad, and I'm pretty sure that has something to do with it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, well, it's good to hear, right, that, that not only are women dragging men in, but men are dragging women yeah. in, too. One of the things that I was curious about in reading Getting Real is the piece around welcoming feedback. Yeah. And, you know, I find that in my own life, I've become more and more open to that, but it takes a willingness to feel like some part of me is you know, dying or burning alive inside. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you guide people to receive feedback from, you know, friends, family, partners, business partners, and, um, and, and yeah, how people can get in the right state in a way to do that. Good. Yeah, I think asking for feedback is is a very important skill because it helps people clear or let go of what they might have been carrying about you. Mm. In the workplace, for example, if, if you want to advance in the workplace, it's really a good idea to let people say any negative stuff they've got to your face. Mm, right. And you, and you really listen openly. I'll, I'll talk about a little more about how to receive and listen in a minute. But, and you listen openly, and they feel heard, and that completes it for them, uh -huh. for most people. Most situations, uh, once you get to express something and you feel heard, it doesn't take up all that mind share anymore. You kind of let go of what you were carrying. So... That's a political thing. I mean, in the workplace, you know, if you, you need to be politically savvy enough to go around asking for feedback mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. all the significant people. Okay, so now in, the, in an intimate relationship, it's kind of obvious that why it would be important because you don't want your partner to have a wall up between you and her or him. Mm -hmm. And the way to break those walls down is to say, could we talk about how we're both feeling about how our relationship is going. Um, mm. Any any feelings or needs that um, you'd like to express that maybe I haven't been paying attention to well enough? You know, ask that question. That is a great question. And then if you if 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 you're already in an ongoing relationship, I like the question. It's it's a two part check in question. It's uh, you agree every week or so to say. Honey, is there anything I've done or said that's created distance between us? Mm. Real simple. And also, is there any, and when you finish that one, is there anything I've done or said that have, has created closeness between us? Mm, so you're getting both sides of it. Yeah, and you both ask each other that question. And I like that one for even a new couple because in the beginning, you're teaching the other person how you like to be treated. Yes. And the romance stage is the most malleable stage of all. Uh, I talk about the five stages in my book, The Couple's Journey, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it, it's still a brilliant book, even though I wrote it in my 20s. 
You wrote it in your 20s. Love that. I love that book. Oh, wow. So just it helps people know that there's life beyond the romance stage and there's life beyond the power struggle stage, which mm-hmm. is the second stage. It's another book, yeah. Yes, power struggle stage is, it's, there is a book about that called Beyond the Power Struggle, uh-huh. which was the sequel. Those are kind of old books, but they're still pretty relevant. Well, to, right. I mean, in this one, was this, you said Getting Real was the first one you wrote? Oh, the first book I wrote was for teachers. Okay. Called Expanding Your Teaching Potential. Well, my, my whole point <laughs> is that however old they are, it's a couple years relevant. Relevant. Beyond the Power Struggle. Uh, <laughs> getting Real is only 20 years ago. That's fairly recent in my life. Yeah. I've, been, I've been doing what I do for 50 years. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being, you know, um, so wise and willing. And I can feel in you, like you said in the beginning, you know, you're not, you're not hurting, you're not struggling right now like you did when you were younger. And I just feel so grateful that you used your, you know, your pain and your struggle to help us and to teach us how to actually be more real and how to create more love and how to create you know, more of the things that we're wanting in our lives. Hmm, thank you for that acknowledgement. Yeah, yeah, it's really... Most of, us, most of us who are coaches know that by using our own pain and, and allowing that to be there, and we, we learn that it just makes us better coaches and counselors. Yeah. And we also learn and can kind of spread the word that everything that happens to you is a learning experience. Mm-hmm. And mo- no, most people have that conceptually now, but we, we but don't really get it. it in our bones. Don't yeah. We? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a wonderful way to live. Mm. Would you say that that's one of the things, you know, one of the pieces of what has you actually able to feel more joyful these days? Is that, is that perspective? Yeah. Uh, you know, ever since I adopted that perspective somewhere in my 20s, uh, life just works. Mm. I was in more pain earlier, but that was necessary for me to get to where I am right now. Well, interesting too. And when you see it as necessary versus you see it as, you know, like, oh shit, I can't believe I'm experiencing this thing. It, it really changes it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's what, what am I needing to learn so that I can be with, you know, be with the situation that right now I'm resisting. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Thank you. If there was one thing you wanted to leave listeners with, what would it be? Well, because of this, this getting real thing uh, is so much about helping people get over controlling the outcome of their interactions mm-hmm. i want to i want to just say that the one one of the essences of that teaching is it's very important to let your partner be unhappy with you sometimes Ooh. <laughs> oh, no. oh i can feel that one you know, i mean you just gotta face it they're gonna be unhappy with you sometimes and see if see if you could just allow that that's part of life you know i i mentioned to you before we started there's a thing that i call the normal pains of an adult relationship wow and we have to figure out what are the normal pains and what are the ones that i shouldn't tolerate but just letting your partner be unhappy being more curious about what that's about hearing them out letting them know that it hurts and it scares you when they're unhappy, uh-huh. it kills you. Oh, it kills me that I've disappointed you. And don't necessarily take it on that it's your fault. Uh-huh. Please, that's almost never your fault. It's almost always them working out their own stuff. But if you can't have space for somebody to be in pain, you'll never get to be more resilient in the face of emotional pain. And I do believe that that's the biggest hang up humanity has right now is mm. that we're too phobic about emotional pain. What I mean is the normal emotional pains. Of uh-huh, uh-huh. And if we could learn that compassionate self inquiry practice that I touched on here, and it's, it's in depth in the five minute relationship repair book it guides you right through the whole thing if you could all learn that 
it's like life is a big self-healing journey. And, mm. and of course, we all need to do some healing. Yeah. And Thank help, you. And help each other heal. God, even in just listening to those, these last two minutes, I feel like you've just given such incredible wisdom. So oh, thanks. Thank you so much for being here and for having this conversation. Well, it's been fun talking to you. You're a great interviewer. Oh, thank and you. I know you have a very successful podcast, and now I know why. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation, and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive. 